Okay. I met our first speaker about a month ago, our next speaker rather, about a month ago, uh, maybe less. Um, uh, in, uh, he uh, has recently taken on a new job in a, as you'll hear, a very challenging environment, um, deliberately so. Um, and he convinced me in, within five minutes of having met him uh, that uh, uh, he was trying to prove something important um, and that I should help him in any way that I can. He's got nearly 10 minutes to convince you of the same thing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the president of uh, Goddard College, Bernard Bull. I rarely script my messages, but with 10 minutes and a compelling narrative to share, I did it this time. So I may be looking down a little bit more than usual. But I, know, I understand this is being recorded. There's audio and no video. So the people from a distance, they may think that I'm doing this just memorized. Um, so here we go. A small college in central Vermont with no grades, no courses, and every student is a co-creator of what and how they learn. Is that relevant for the 21st century? In July of 1938, Tim Pitkin and a group of others uh, launched a higher education experiment informed by the progressive ideals of Dewey, Kilpatrick, and many others. Goddard College, a small experimental school that grew out of the cultural and ideological soil of New England, plain living and hard thinking. This was and is an education model influenced by the growth of fascism in the West and a growing conviction that a democratic society depends upon a nation of people where voice, choice, ownership, and agency are nurtured and celebrated. Rather than an education model built upon the assumption that learners succeed through compliance and submission to the will of the professors and administrators, Goddard sought to invite learners into virtually all aspects of the community. The college was envisioned and enacted as an experimental and experimenting college, not static, but adapting and responding to the needs of learners and the world. I paused, and if you want to know the reason for that pause, ask me afterward. True to Dewey's education ideals, Goddard embraced the notion that all of life and the world is our curriculum, and that we should make every effort to avoid siloing one's formal education from the rest of life. As such, there were no co-curriculars at Goddard. If you wanted to launch a club, launch it for the entire community, neighbors and all. In the first decades of the college, students started a community fire station, which exists today, a community health care center, which exists and is run by the state today, and a sustainable farm, and many other things like that. There were and are no traditional faculty ranks. Faculty rarely, if ever, go by the, by the title doctor. They are mentors, guides who stand alongside students, launching each student's semester with a simple but profound question. What do you want and need to learn? In fact, this is universal and unlike any higher ed institution I've ever seen, where every single faculty member embraces a shared educational model and the core pedagogical principles associated with that model. There are no exceptions, people closing the door and doing their own things differently. Uh, there were and still are no letter grades as they failed to embody the values of a culture of learning over a culture of rating, ranking, and earning. Instead, students produce several packets of work, work each semester, and they receive mentoring um, uh, along the way, as well as rich and extensive narrative feedback at the end of each semester. A Goddard transcript, by the way, is unlike anything that I've ever seen in K-12 or higher education. Sometimes they can be upwards of 15 to 20 pages. Because of its experimental model, its learner-driven vision for education, the progressive uh, social ideals, Goddard actually became a hub for any number of people. It housed the Alternative Media Conference, which some of you may have, maybe have heard about. There's some sketchy stories in there, too. Uh, is the campus where the members of the band Fish developed their distinct style. The Bread and Puppet Theater was the theater in residence in the 70s and remains a strong connection. The playwright David Mamet, um, was a faculty member there, and his mentoring launched the careers of many well-known actors, playwrights, and directors. Leading educational theorists and philosophers gathered at this small rural campus in central Vermont to explore the future of education and society. I continue to be amazed at finding out when I, I come across these fascinating experiments and sort of quirky and, and experimental initiatives in education and sustainability and elsewhere, it is so often there is some Goddardite hidden within that experiment. 
Uh, from the beginning and inspired by a strong New England spirit of self-reliance. Um, oh, I actually skipped a paragraph. Sorry about that. Um, from its beginning, the community shared a vision of a college that was not for traditional age college students, but also a place for adults to study, a place for lifelong learners as well. In 1963, Evelyn Bates, studying at the University of Chicago, assistant to the president at Goddard, she conceived of this model for something called a low residency adult degree program and Goddard launched the first one in the nation. From the beginning, and inspired by a strong New England spirit of self-reliance, the college refused to invest in creating or growing an endowment, which is why it has less than a $2 million endowment today. As such, Goddard has always been somewhat vulnerable and struggled amid times of fluctuating enrollment, facing well over a half a dozen moments of near closure in its short history. In 2002, the college was in such dire financial straits that it reduced its staff down to almost five, sold off a sizable portion of the campus, and closed its residential program. Today, all of Goddard's 10 programs are low residency, with students coming to our Plainfield, Vermont, or Seattle, Washington site for one 10-day residency each semester, working independently on a personal learning plan between those res residencies, connecting with the advisor via video conferencing and other ad hoc tools. If you want a defense of Goddard's educational model, one need not look any further than the long and inspiring list of alumni, not to mention current students. We have a particularly strong record of creating a space where students grow into inspiring artists, activists, music musicians, alternative school founders and educators, social entrepreneurs, champions of health and wellness, and leaders around imaginative work in sustainability. I accepted the presidency of Goddard in November, so I'm at six months right now. Right before that, the college was placed on probation Yes, I did say that right before that. The college was placed on probation <laughs> with the New England Commission on Higher Education for concerns about finance, governance, and leadership instability. It had only one third of an admission staff, had few to no cash reserves, little to no endowment, an aging physical plant with significant, um, with significant deferred maintenance, an outdated technological infrastructure across offices that requires extensive tasks, manual tasks, uncommon in many places, for example, every single transcript in the school is personally generated by a person in the registrar's office. And a staff of faculty struggling with fears and anxiety over instability, recovering from a loss of a 30% staff retrenchment. With my first three, within my first three months, the board chair passed away, as well as one of the most respected, trusted, and beloved members of the community. It is without question a community under stress, perhaps even a community grieving. And yet, when the first residency of the fall started in November, our MFA program in writing, which is one of the top 10 low residency programs in the nation, I witnessed firsthand the incredible magic, can magic be empirical, um, of this radical educational model. It's not perfect, but it's inspiring, promising, and, and at a minimum, fascinating. I saw learners self-organizing social and intellectual activities. I heard students share with passion their personal, personally designed plans for the forthcoming semester. And I heard about how many students beautifully blended and blurred their learning plans with the rest of their lives. Then I attended a graduation ceremony, actually eight of them an event that's separate for every program at Goddard. And every single graduate is personally introduced by an advisor who speaks carefully crafted commentary on the student's culminating work. That's followed by the student being given the podium and a free form uh, message to the audience. At Goddard, every single student is the valedictorian of their one of a kind curriculum and learning journey. Uh, and, they tr and we treat them as such. It's deeply rigorous, creating the conditions for each student to find and refine their voice, to practice and grow in making wise choices, to take full ownership for their life and learning, and to know that what they do and say can and will have an impact in the world. As a scholar of educational innovation, learner-driven education and alternative models of education, one who's conducted well over a thousand interviews and studied hundreds of learning communities, I can say with confidence I've never seen anything like this place. With all of its challenges and present fragility, I'm convinced that at a minimum, its existence offers a compelling and inspiring alternative to the dominant models and systems in contemporary higher education. And yet, because Goddard is one of many struggling New England colleges that's in a fragile situation, I already see people making an unfortunate and empirically flawed assumption about why the college is in its current situation. As one reporter framed her question, do you think all this struggle of progressive education institutions is simply evidence that it's no longer relevant or functional? It's an interesting question. 
We have a solid plan on how to stabilize the college and grow it, but it's complex. It's a game of poker more than a game of chess. And we all know that even if you play your hand perfectly, there's a measure of chance and uncertainty with every hand. We do not have any, any aces in our, uh, any endowment aces <laughs> in our pocket that we can slip into the game when we have a poor hand. But I can say this as I did to that reporter. What we're doing in so many ways, what we are striving to figure out is a key part of the contemporary debate, the collection of contemporary debates in education. The number of self-directed and learner-driven K-12 schools has grown tenfold in the last decade in this country. Where is the higher education equivalent? Debates, debates about the efficacy of industrial education practices like letter grades, the Carnegie unit, and a celebration of mass-produced education continue and are intens intensifying, but places like Goddard offer a concrete, compelling, and promising contrast Democracy, more than ever, is in need of education models that nurture voice, choice, ownership, and agency, not to mention learning and living across difference, another value that we hold, um, we hold in tension at our college. Employers and communities are craving people who take initiative, have ownership, and approach their work with competence, confidence, creativity, and a sense of agency. Our nation thrives upon people who take the road less traveled, and this education model is an institutional expression of that. And for any who need more evidence for the value of this model and what I hope remains a rich and diverse education ecosystem, I invite them to join me for an examination of the extraordinary lives and accomplishments of our alumni. And this is from a longstanding non-exclusive approach to admissions. It's my hope and plan to do what I can to offer the upcoming months to help stabilize and strengthen this beautiful higher ed community. But I accepted this role knowing that it was and remains a fragile and high-risk situation with no guarantees, requiring me to revisit and reevaluate the direction almost weekly, keeping the well-being of the current students as the highest priority, even above saving or stabilizing the college. And yet to this audience and to others following the trends in higher education, I hope that we do not make the mistake of conflating the need for a more stable financial model with the promise and possibility of this and many other expressions of learner-driven liberatory education. This is a model that when it is eventually combined with the current and emerging generation of educational technology will offer a truly compelling and wide-reaching higher education alternative. I'm aggressively in search of people and partners who are inspired to join in making that a reality. That's part of why I made the trip here. Thanks. Thank you.